Welcome to the Healing Broken Families podcast, where I host conversations on divorce, parental alienation, and high conflict personalities through a solution focused lens. And with every episode having the intention of healing and love showing up to support us on our journey. Today, we have an exciting guest. And we're going to be exploring a super relevant topic that promises to be super juicy. So I'm excited. Um, Karen McMahon, did I say that correct, Karen? McMahon, yes. McMahon is a certified relationship and divorce coach and the founder of Journey Beyond Divorce. Karen leads a national team of divorce coaches in supporting men and women around the world to become calm, clear, and confident as they navigate divorce. Karen is the host of the acclaimed Journey Beyond Divorce podcast, co-author of Stepping Out of Chaos, Turning Pain into Possibility, and the creator and founder of Journey Beyond Divorce's exclusive 12-step discovery recovery divorce program. I said that completely wrong. (laughs) 12-step divorce recovery program. Well, Karen, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, it's an honor, an honor. And it was nice chatting with you before we got started. Um, I think I'd like to begin by asking you, uh, Karen, what is a divorce coach and exactly? And why is it important to consider retaining a divorce coach? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think most matrimonial attorneys know about therapists. And so if they have a client who's emotionally struggling, the thought is, the first thought is, will I refer to them? Can I refer them to a therapist? And so I I say that to kind of give a comparison because what is divorce coaching versus therapy? Um, A divorce coach is often a a life coach uh, who's focusing on divorce and coaching is about helping people get from where they are to where they want to be. And so coaching is really about helping people through transition. Divorce is the most devastating transition anyone is ever going to face. It's a multi-tiered, multi-dimensional, super overwhelming transition. And so what a divorce coach does, or certainly me and my team, is we come alongside clients and we support them in two ways. One is through the emotional tsunami of divorce. The fear, the uncertainty, the overwhelm, the the anger, the heartbreak, the whole bit, which really can make us a rather sloppy version of ourselves. And so we support our clients through the emotional storm so that they can get, as you had said earlier, calm, clear, and confident so that they can effectively navigate the practical side of divorce. And we help them on the practical side of divorce because We have networks of matrimonial attorneys, financial planners, child specialists, um, that we can support them in knowing who are the players and do you need that player on your team? And then can I introduce you to someone who might be a good fit? And so, so there are these two avenues that we go down with divorce, the emotional and the practical. And the difference between a therapist and a divorce coach, I'm going to say this in two simple ways. One is therapy tends to be more healing and past focused. Coaching tends to be more present and forward focused and very strategic. And um, and a therapist may know a little bit about divorce, whereas a divorce coach is swimming in a pool that they know very well. So so those of us who are divorce coaches, we understand how the court works. We understand the difference between mediation, legislation, collaboration, litigation. So we can really support our clients in um, very specifically in whatever it is they're facing. Yeah, I really like what you said, because I think most people generally get, I need to retain a divorce or family law attorney, Mm -hmm. maybe don't quite understand why they might also want to retain equally as important a divorce coach. And I remember when I was sorting things out, I really felt that women needed to have a support team in addition to a legal team. Would you agree with that? 
Yes, and I would say the third prong that is one of my few tells is you need you need a financial expert on your team. Absolutely. And so, yeah, because because divorce, a, a financial expert had once said to me in the beginning of my career, she goes, you know, marriage is all about love, divorce is all about money. Now we know that divorce can equally be about shared parenting time and decision making, but largely. Um, a huge portion of divorce is about money. And if you're not comfortable with money uh, and you don't understand your own personal finances or you haven't been in control of them, having a financial expert who is very comfortable with numbers is as important as having a divorce coach and a matrimonial attorney, not any attorney, a matrimonial attorney on your team. That sounds like a powerful supportive triangle of support. And, yeah. and great point, because a lot of women aren't confident, oftentimes, not always with the finances, especially if their husband um, was in charge of that, or it can work both ways, of course, but um, finances and have, are a huge part of divorce, absolutely. Yeah. And education, information is power, and it's important that you educate yourself. And um, if you're not comfortable in the financial realm, when you speak to somebody who just, you know, who plays with numbers every day, that's a person who's going to help build your confidence and clarity around what you have, um, what you need, what you deserve, what you want to settle with. Absolutely. That's yeah. a really, really powerful point. So let's go back to the beginning of the podcast, if you don't mind, Karen, when I said I felt that this was going to be a really relevant conversation. Because right now, so many families are facing divorce. A lot of families are getting divorced. And COVID has only exaggerated or made that so much more true. Um, yesterday, I listened to a neat podcast of a man who went through an awful divorce. And he's actually on the run with his child because he doesn't want his child vaccinated. But the mother does. And over the holidays, I had so many calls from family parents that were wanting to see their children, but were alienated from their children. And I'm part of a support team for a mom that can't see her, her kids, and she's a fantastic mom. So there's, you started to get into some of those turbulent tsunami emotions that come up during divorce. Yes. But I just want to deepen the, the painting a little bit more and I spent a bit of time getting into a divorce state for you before this podcast, uh, which is easy for me to do because there's some really strong emotions that if you don't manage them, they can take over the divorce game. Would you agree? Absolutely. It's, it's vital that we learn that we use the pain of divorce to um, understand our own uh, ways of being, our own triggers, insecurities, uh, so that we can grow through this and, and be more effective as we navigate negotiations that are going to impact the rest of our lives. Mm, ex exactly. That really resonated with me. So we're going through a divorce, and I would imagine, and I know from experience that we can feel uh, overwhelmed. You mentioned that. Yeah. For me, being fearful was uh, a main emotion, just this overriding, um, terrorizing fear. Yep. Anger, um, uh, anger, resentment, control in the conflict um, power struggles, um, fear, fears around money, a lot of crying, um, mourning, grieving, all of these emotions and so many of them toxic emotions. Mm. So it was really neat on your website when you said that you help, um, people navigate some of those biggest emotions and turn, you know, that pain into positive transformation. So I'll just invite you to speak about, about that. Yeah, I, I, my belief is that, you know, when we face any crisis in life, mm -hmm. uh, there is an opportunity to either look outside at the person or circumstance and blame and focus on what's wrong with that, 
or to use the opportunity to look inside and say, what, what is going on with me? And so I, I was married to someone with a personality disorder. I had a very high conflict marriage. I had a very three and a half year high conflict divorce where he was going to take the kids away. He was going to leave me penniless. The police got involved. CPS got involved. I, I, I was in sales. I lost all of my sales. I was all of a sudden penniless. I mean, it was just like, talk about fear. There was fear on every single front. And, you know, being in the position I'm in now, I, I, I support my clients in slowing things down right? Because the fear story is this big, loud fear story. And it's like, okay, um, first of all, let's slow that down. You know, the fear might be, I'm never going to see my children again. How true is that? I'm going to be homeless and in the street. Okay, you might be in a worse position. What's the likelihood that you'd be homeless and in the street? And when we start shining a spotlight on the fear story of the client, the fear story is always the worst case scenario squared, like on, on, on steroids. It's not okay. true. It's almost never, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's never true. It may be a, a, a slighter version of that. So what happens? Our cortisol goes off. We go into fight, flight, or freeze based on a story that's not true. And so a key thing is to... And if you're, you know, as, as those of you who are listening to really start looking at your fears, your fear stories, and just how true is it? And if this isn't true, what version of it is? And even that brings the temperature down because it's like, oh, I won't be homeless, but I might have to go move back in with my mother who I really don't want to live with but it's certainly a whole lot better than being homeless. Or I might have to put my, you know, three kids in a two bedroom apartment and they'll complain, but I'm not actually gonna be homeless. Like, so you begin to look at what's more real. So that's on the fear front. And then the uncertainty front, which is huge, right? Where am I gonna live? How much am I gonna see my kids? How much money am I gonna have? Same thing, the stories take us to, I'm, I'm going to live in a basement or I'm going to be homeless. I'm not going to have any money. I'm never going to see my kids. My ex is going to turn them against me. And not that some of those things don't happen. They do. You and I both coach around that. But what I encourage is that we stay with what's real. And what's real is what's factual. So your opinion isn't factual. Your fear isn't factual. The facts are factual. Right now, I see my children four nights a week. I'd like to see them more. Um, this is what's going on. Like you stick with the facts. And when you operate from what's actually true and factual, you're always going to be in a better position. And it will begin to calm that um, emotional chaos. Like you'll be able to, and that's what we work with people on, how to regulate your emotions so that you can actually engage in these negotiations yeah it's so valuable to um like you said calm those emotions and step out of the divorce chaos to get the outcomes that you really deserve and that you really want for yourself and and for your children yes and and if i could just comment on another thing that that i think is rampant especially with high conflict divorces is how many of us are as abusive to ourselves as our spouses might have been to us. And so this, the level of self-condemnation, self-judgment, I'm such an idiot, I should have known better. It does you absolutely no good at all to beat yourself up. In fact, if you wanna get ahead, if you wanna emotionally levitate past anger and hurt to let's say forgiveness, compassion, peace, you, you can't be beating yourself up. It pushes you back down into the ditch. And so I know for me, um, I was raised with a critical voice. I married a critical voice and then I had my own critical voice. And so I had to divorce my own critical voice. And, and you can't do that until you bring your conscious awareness to the fact that I criticize myself all the time. I had a client, um, she was in England, 
and she showed me this letter that she wrote and I looked at it and I said, it's just drenched in self-judgment. And she looked at the exact same page and she said, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, could we go line by line? Can I just point a few <laughs> things out to you? She was blown away. After we did that, she was like, oh my God, they're screaming off the page. But 10 minutes earlier, she didn't even see them. Until we bring our conscious awareness to something, we don't know that it exists. And also that's really the power of working in harmony and alignment with your coach. Because sometimes when you're in the divorce jar, you just can't see the label. Mm -hmm. You can't see those blind spots that um, are no longer serving you. So, yeah. Yeah, the ability for, you know, as a, as a divorce coach, as a coach, um, our job is to um, be a, a, a stand for um, non-judgment and support and to be a reflection back to the client. So a client might say something and then, you know, even just asking this is so, if we go back to the homeless thing, right? So, um, so I'm hearing that you really think that there's a good chance you'll be homeless. And just sometimes hearing your own thoughts said back to you, it's like, well, no, not really. And, and so being that sounding board is really powerful. Being a safe space where the person can be totally vulnerable and know that they're not being judged. Those are the things that I think enable us to support, especially those who've been felt so broken by um, toxic relationships. Mm, absolutely. A safe, neutral space um, is really, it's really is priceless. And the sooner you can give that gift to yourself, yes. um, the, you know, really the faster and farther you'll probably go in your divorce journey. Um, it's true. And in fact, a lot of people, because there's so much money fear, the first thought um, is I can't afford, I can't afford an attorney and a coach. So that's the first thought. And when you think about um, your self-care as spending instead of investing, right? So what you want to do is switch it. You're investing in yourself. And when you invest in yourself and you're calm and you're clear and you can you can partner with your attorney and work toward the best possible settlement, you're going to walk away with more money. You're investing both in your self-growth, right? Yes. And, and your healing as well as in the best possible settlement. And so that's often a leap of faith. I mean, a lot of times our clients will say, I, I don't know if this is going to help it, the, you know, but I'm going to take a leap of faith and, you know, it's, it's, I, I want to say never, although I don't like using always and never, I'm going to say it's incredibly rare for someone to feel that they made a mistake in doing that. Mm. I really believe that that's a worthwhile investment, um, especially yeah. when it, you're moving on to new phase where you're giving yourself that self-love and self-compassion and wanting to, to, navigate the journey to those higher vibrational emotions and yes. and not stay spend the short amount of time as possible in the toxic emotions and like you said on a practical level it doesn't really help so much when you're in your office with your attorney and you can't breathe or you can't stop crying um, or you can't really think um, logically because your your emotions are unmanaged uh, or you're under supported. So I really, really believe in what, what you do. Thank you. Um, so I acknowledge you. Now we've talked a little bit, Karen, about navigating emotions and those turbulent emotions, but how much of that relates to mindset? I will say that in most cases, uh, our thoughts, right? Our mindset, our perspectives are hardwired into our emotions. And so if my perspective is that the glass is half empty, I'm going to be sad. And if I, my perspective is the glass is half full, I'm going to be encouraged. And so whatever your mindset is, 
uh, we, we have in our 12 step divorce recovery program, step seven is um, rekindle confidence. And the way we rekindle confidence is to take a look at the story we're telling and to rewrite it if it doesn't serve us. And so we each write a story and then we tell all of our friends our story. Oh my God, this is so terrible. I'm such a victim. These terrible things happened. He's such a bad guy, which all may be true, but does the story serve you? As opposed to, I've gotten clear, I've made a decision, I'm stepping out in faith, I'm, um, I'm, I'm believing in a better tomorrow, like everything's about perspective and mindset. And so this isn't saying to like, if you've been in an abusive relationship, you're, you're walking away with some wounds and, and pr probably some insecurities and, you know, nobody's saying to whitewash that, uh, what I am saying is in spite of that, when you can speak to the inner strength that you know you have, the, the, the future that you're working toward and building, that's the mindset that makes all the difference in the world. Beautiful. That is truly beautiful. And that really will serve you in the forward expansion of yeah. your life. I had a, I had a client recently and she, um, her very first session with me, she was really upset. And she said, um, I just, you know, I, I'm old and I, I think I'm going to be, you know, alone and lonely for the rest of my life. And I was like, how old are you? <laughs> She's about my age. And I was like, okay, so I don't think that's old. And do, do you have a fatal illness? Are you not going to be around much longer? Like, what's the story? And she was like, no, it's just I'm old and I'm crusty and nobody's going to love me. Well, a couple of sessions later, we got a, a hoot out of revisiting that concept, but it was, it was her perspective. It was her mindset. And I said to her, so, so how does it feel when you think that way? And she's like, oh my God, I'm so depressed and discouraged. And well, what if that weren't true? What's, what's another possibility? I mean, this is a, a woman who hiked and skied and I was like, you're, you're, you know, you're not in crutches. You're not like ill. You're and PS, uh, she ended up getting into a relationship pretty quickly after she healed and, and reached out to me. And she was like, just the mindset difference. I never would have met the guy if I believed that I was old and crusty and, nobody would love me. And so mindset is so powerful. The stories we create, and we don't even realize we're doing it. It's like, you're the narrator. You're the author of the story. Is, is the story you're writing the one you want to be living? Because if it isn't, you know, cross it out and write the one you want and, and live into that belief. And that will become reality. That's so powerful because it, it is amazing how much of a grasp those negative stories can, how much space they can take up. And for those going through abusive, uh, leaving abusive marriages or in an abusive divorce, you know, sometimes that abuser rents a room in our head and um, we don't even know it. So it could be their critical voice, our critical voice. Um, so again, like just to shift focus onto what what do you want to create? And I love that you ask your clients to rewrite, rewrite their stories. Yeah. And I love what you just said too. I just need to comment on it because I, I wrote a blog on um, evicting the person who's in your head. So you say a room, I say the whole thing, everything ear to ear and oh, yeah. <laughs> right. And yeah. I, I'll be, I'll be talking to clients and I'll say, you know, what do you think about X? And they'll say, well, my husband says, or well, my wife says, and I'm like, she's not here. I'm not coaching her. Ask her to leave the room. I'll wait. <laughs> I love that. Now yeah. let's figure out what you think. And, and it's, and I try to use humor when I coach because it, I think it helps, but the truth is, and, and I was there, like he had full, full reign between my ears. It wasn't his fault. He didn't even know he had that much power, but because of the years of experience, I would think something would happen and I would literally see it through his eyes first, 
think about what his reaction was first before I even knew what my thought and reaction was. That's a full renting space in your head. And what we want to do is we want to evict that person. You want to have them pack their luggage and, and go packing someplace else. And that's really powerful. And you'll notice it because every time something happens, slow it down and, and think, am I thinking my thoughts and feeling my feelings first? Mm -hmm. Or am I thinking the other person's thoughts and feeling their feelings first? And if so, I have some work to do. That's all. That's all it is. I have some work to do to find my way back to me and evicting them is step one. So I love that you said that, the renting space. Yeah. And before we got on this podcast, I was just writing about how it's coming back to yourself. I actually posted like, are you returning back to yourself? And it's a process. It's a process. Yeah. And I think with some people, um, they're not returning back to themselves because they were never with themselves because it goes all the way back to their family of origin. And I have clients who it's like, well, first dad was in my head because he was a big personality in this way. And then it was every boyfriend or girlfriend and, and now it's my wife. And, and so it's like, so they're not even finding their way back. They're finding their way for the first time. Um, and, and, if you think about it as devastating as divorce is, as overwhelming, as painful as it is, mm -hmm. if that's the catalyst that brings you back to who you are and helps you become the best version of yourself, it's a lot of good that comes out of a bad thing. Absolutely, that's true. And sometimes it takes you a while to see the gifts when you're in that storm. Uh. But earlier on, you were really kind of hitting a point for me when you were talking about your clients experiencing a fear of being homeless or having homelessness. And like that was that can be a very overpowering fear and a pretty common fear, I would say. And that particular fear goes right back to family of origin or our childhood and yeah. those mother father um, attachment wounds. And so our first attachment wound uh, comes back to get rehealed in divorce and so we have a chance to like heal everything that we never healed and that's why I personally feel divorce can be so overwhelming because you're like well I just wanted to get divorced from my husband I didn't want to deal with my dad and my uncle or whatever right and it can be so many layers so um and yet the people who just get the legal divorce um we deal with folks post-divorce and I've had so many people come to me who they suffered for two, four, I had one fella 10 years post-divorce and he was still in the same emotional wrangling with his ex and not even over the kids, just never detached, never did that severing and healing. And, and so when we started looking at his situation, he had stories. Oh my God, this woman 10 years later was still on a pedestal and she was so awesome and wonderful. And, you know, he, he, he was the loser who lost the prize. And when we started poking around at it, this was a woman who was never supportive, who spent every penny he made, who, and so again, it goes back to that step seven, that story. And as he began to write the story and, and settle into, it was almost like he felt guilty saying something negative, but when he settled into not bad mouthing her, but just saying factually, mm. these things happened. I, I got awards and she would never come and support me. I worked three jobs and she didn't work, but she always spent so much more than I made. Like I, and just, and then it was like, okay, it was the beginning of him unweaving from her. And, and so to your point, if you and I could give a fast forward button to all of our clients, we would be stealing from them the greatest growth. The growth is in in the catalyst, right? The growth is in the crucible of divorce. That's what I want to say. It's like a fire of refinement. You go through it. You don't just get divorced. You, you heal your wounds. You refine your shortcomings. You become a better version of yourself. You end up being a better parent, a better partner, a better 
son or daughter. Like there's so many amazing things that, how often do we get a chance to run into a brick wall and say, okay, what's not working? What if, <laughs> What am I doing that doesn't work? What are the limiting beliefs from my childhood? What are the wounds of my first intimate relationships? What am I bringing to the table that, that I would like to leave behind? That's really powerful work. Absolutely agree. And we all, we all have a part in the conflict. You know, it's really interesting. I was talking to a woman in my private group last week and she said, I don't, I don't talk to him. And I don't talk to my daughter. So I really literally either there's no conflict because I don't talk to them. But yet I just pointed out, but yet you're here complaining and agonizing and telling a long story of a very alive conflict. But you you but you're saying there's no conflict because you don't see them. So I just thought that was really interesting when I pointed that out because she was suffering from the conflict, maybe not physically, but energetically, spiritually. Um. Absolutely. And conflict, you know, I had a client who said, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't do conflict. And much like this person you're talking about, you know, there are those who explode, right? So those are the screaming, yelling ones. And then there are those who implode, who get very quiet and shut down and maybe silent treatment, maybe passive aggressive, again, all the trails to our family of origin. Conflict isn't about yelling and screaming and throwing emotional grenades across the room, although that is conflict. Conflict is, are you walking around with peace? To your point, the woman in your group, she was not there with a peaceful heart. She had internal conflict, frustration, worry, um, disappointment, aggravation, judgment, whatever it is. And so um, going through this and learning how to how to handle conflict in a healthy way. And if we grew up in a household, I grew up in a household where my mom was Italian, there was yelling and screaming all the time. My dad was passive aggressive. He would sit there quietly. So what did I know going into the real world? Nothing. I like knew nothing about handling conflict in a healthy way. My divorce taught me. Divorce can teach you so much if you're open to it. Mm, that's beautiful, Karen. That's really beautiful. Yeah. I like that. I like that because the really the bottom line and the facts are that conflict exists and we actually encounter conflict all over, you know, in the workplace. We meet high conflict people. Um, we have to face conflict. And I think that was one of the biggest, biggest lessons in my divorce. I always thought that too. I was like super gentle, super submissive. And I was like, I had no idea how to deal with conflict right. and manage and conflict. And so when we ask people what's their part, and I would love to just, just a, a couple of words on that. If you're a conflict avoidant, that's going to be part of your part. If you're a people pleaser, that's part of your part. If you're a codependent, that's part of your part. If you're a perfectionist, that's part of your part. And so for those of us who married these very difficult, high conflict personalities who might be controlling or nasty in the mouth or, um, or harsh in other ways, it's easy to say, well, I could see what his or her problem is and what their part is, but I just gave 200%. I just kept bending over backwards. I just tried and tried and tried. And you slow that down. It's like, so you were getting 5% and giving 200%. Let's take a look at that. What's that about? Like, would you have given 500% and still gotten 5%? Like at what, and, and, and not with judgment, with curiosity, what was going on for you that you kept giving and giving and giving without getting anything back? And when we slow it down, we begin to find out it's a childhood wound. It's a codependent behavior. Um, most people who are codependent are also people pleasers. I, I like people to like me. It makes me uncomfortable if I think someone doesn't like me. Well, what's that about? Why is that? There are billions of people on the earth. Does everybody have to like you? What's the likelihood that that's going to happen? And we just begin to tease each of these concepts apart to get to what's real for each individual. So our part, the person married to the high conflict personality, you absolutely have a part. Um, 
you may be boundary oblivious. You may have been raised in a household without boundaries. You don't know what boundaries are. You married a boundary oblivious person. You didn't know how to set them. Uh, that's part of your part because as a healthy adult, we need to be able to communicate well. We need to be able to um, speak through disagreement, which doesn't have to be conflict. We have to be able to set boundaries. We have to be able to love ourselves more than we love anybody else so that we can be healthy in all of our relationships. And so when we didn't learn those things, how would we possibly know them? This is your opportunity to learn them and grow into them. Oh, I got goosebumps when you were saying that. That yeah. is, it is a beautiful, a beautiful opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah. And I love the birds behind you, um, those symbolic birds. But really earlier, what you were saying about going into the fire, Really, it's that transformational phoenix bird that is is the opportunity you were just describing that divorce can offer you. Yep, rise from the ashes, absolutely. <laughs> and 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 your your best chapter of life is um, ahead of you. Mm, it's a great a, a great attitude, a great awareness, a great mindset. So let's just shift gears a bit. And I'd like to ask you, what are some common mistakes that you've observed human beings making during divorce? Um, um, that's, a, that's a great question. So the, the first one that just immediately comes to mind is um, you, you believe that your, your spouse knows more than you. And, and so one of my favorite sayings to clients is just because he or she says it doesn't make it so. Oh, yeah. So especially when you're dealing with a high conflict individual and narcissists in particular, they're actually incredibly insecure people, but they have like a 365 degree blind spot. So when they speak, they speak with like certainty that most human beings don't have because they're hundred <laughs> percent certain because it has to be their way. There is no other way. So, so when they say you're going to, you're, you're going to lose the kids and you're not going to have any money. And this is going to be the, the, biggest mistake you made and the courts are going to give me x y and z and then you start drinking that kool-aid like my question is if your husband or wife is not a matrimonial attorney why in god's name do you believe a word they're saying exactly but in the moment you you really you really might i know often I, I, will <laughs> i would say you often will and that's why this kind of a conversation is so important. So if you are listening and you happen to be in the early stages and your spouse is kind of bullying you into um, believing something he or she is saying, uh, why would they know any better than you? And if, and I can't tell you how often I'll have clients who they're, they're actually believing their, their soon to be ex's words over their matrimonial attorney's words. And I'm like, let's take a look at that. One person, this is their profession. This is what they do nine to five, Monday through Friday. And the other person never before divorced or maybe once. Um, but like, what do they know? They know what they want. So what they're saying is what they want, not what's going to happen. And so that's the number one mistake is that don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't believe what your soon-to-be ex says. It's irrelevant what they tell you will happen. Is 100% irrelevant. What your matrimonial attorney tells you may happen, that is very relevant. That you want to have eyes and ears wide open and hear what they're saying. If this goes to court, this is what a judge would say. This is how uh, shared parenting typically uh uh, breaks down. This is this is what um, spousal support in this particular jurisdiction typically is. You want to listen really clearly to that because it may be information that you don't like. That's more real information, not not what your spouse is saying. I think that's just super super important. What you just said, like don't drink the Kool Aid. That's really really important, and to trust your attorney and what they're saying and where where you're putting your focus. Um, it's very also practical, but it does bring me back again to the beginning of our podcast when you mentioned the word triggers, because your spouse knows your triggers, I would, I would presume. And, um, and so there's that comp aspect of it too. I, I have a, an article that I wrote uh, called Don't Push My Buttons. 
And so our buttons predate our marriage. So it's not your spouse's fault that you have whatever the button is. The button goes all the way back to your childhood or your earlier in your life, but they know what they are. And so they can poke away and drive you nuts. And so the idea isn't to tell them to keep, to not push my buttons. The idea is to figure out what's my button, what's my tender underbelly, my insecurity, my character flaw, whatever it is. And how do I desensitize it? How do I unplug it? How do I work on it and heal myself or refine myself in that way so that my soon to be ex can poke away all he or she wants and I'm going to be like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, that's really when you can step into your personal power. That's it. If someone's pushing your buttons, you, you, you can't access your right. personal power. Right. And so you have, and that's wh where do we have agency? We have agency over ourselves, 100%. But not until we grow our awareness and our acceptance and then start doing something about it. And so if somebody's pushing your buttons, they have no power or control over you. You have power and control that you may not have realized or started to use just yet. Mm, that's very exciting. It's exciting to, to see the potential of when you can return to yourself <sighs> and start gaining awareness of, okay, where am I habitually giving away my power? How yep. can I step into my personal power one step at a time? Like that's really, it's really percolating inside of me like that's an exciting new pathway for someone who may have been disempowered or constantly having their buttons pushed and reacting yeah and and i want to go back to your other question about mistakes that people make another one sure is um if you've been living in a high conflict divorce a lot of people have a tendency to wanna to go out and hire a top gun, a really um, big guns attorney, right? And because that way they can go toe to toe with your soon to be ex. The problem is if you hire an attorney who's a bully, you're not just gonna be bullied by your ex, you're gonna be bullied by your attorney. I, I, I just love what you're saying. Like, this is such a fun conversation because Earlier, you were saying just a few minutes ago, if you're divorcing a narcissistic ex and you're believing everything that your ex is telling you instead of your own attorney, there are times and there's so many wonderful and at family law attorneys that provide moral leadership and yep. fantastic solid advice. And we love those family attorneys. But oftentimes, other times, there's attorneys that are in it for the power and they can also be narcissistic and they can also push your buttons and they can also scare the living daylights out of you with false stories. So if you're starting to believe your ex and his attorney and those two narcissistic personalities are syncing up, then you're really um, need a divorce coach. I mean, then it really gets ter terrifying. Um, so I, I think that the, 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 so the call to action on this one is if you're looking for an attorney, um, on our podcast, I've interviewed a number of attorneys. And one of the questions I ask all of them is what are the questions my listeners should ask attorneys when they're, mm -hmm. when they're interviewing one. So, so you get it right from the horse's mouth. So there's like five different episodes and each attorney gives their list of questions, which is great. Um, but there are some things that we all know, right? So what I would say is write a list of what you don't have. Uh, I'm not listened to, I'm not validated, I'm not responded to, I'm not respected. And then make sure that when you speak to the attorney, like you are getting all of those things. And so if you ask an attorney, like there's, if you ask an attorney a question, and they, let me tell you a story, and they go off on a tangent and you don't get your question answered, you best to ask that question again. And if you don't, and then you're like, oh, he or she sounded really good, I'm gonna hire them. It's like, how responsive are they? How well do they listen? How well do they explain? What is their level of patience while you're filled with anxiety? Like, are they 
providing a safe space and a comfort because if not you might walk away going well that guy's like tough as nails he's gonna nail my ex he's gonna nail you too be careful do not hire another version of your soon-to-be ex to represent you i've worked with clients who've done that it's really displeasing not like me to say this word but i'm gonna say it Boom, you just nailed it. I mean, that sounds like it might not be plausible to happen, but I believe that does happen because it's you're you're attracting what you're used to. Yes. You've seen a mirror of your abusive husband and then you go, I feel safe with that. That's what I know. And you hire a domineering, abusive, top gun killer family law attorney. And what happens is it's just it doesn't work out well. It's not, it's not a great um great combination so I would I would say just listening to you in this podcast that slowing it down in your attorney's office when you're posing those questions would be also very valuable before you make a decision in retaining a family law attorney I really liked what you just said I always like to be really transparent with my story I did that I kept hiring my husband over and over again and that wasn't fun (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, what I say to people is this is your first serious relationship post-divorce or going into your divorce. So this is it. So you might've been married for 10, 30, 40 years, whatever. And now you're connecting with somebody. This is your person, your matrimonial per- attorney. That's the person you need to be able to be totally transparent with, totally vulnerable with, totally trusting you have to make that decision carefully and with incredible discernment because that's the person who you're partnering with for the first time since your partnership you're partnering with to get through and beyond um, this divorce process very well said karen like very well said it's um I often tell, I've often said that you want to, you know, you want to have a monogamous relationship with your family law attorney, you know, and not a serial monogamous relationship where you keep firing them because, you know, and I did fire a few attorneys. So that is very much uh, empowering advice for our audience. Thank you for that. Any last uh, big mistakes that you'd like to leave our audience with? You've just, you know, two great ones. Yeah, I think, um, God, there's, there's two that I actually would like to, we spoke about one, so I'll just mention it um, quickly, which is make sure you educate yourself financially. Uh, so having financial support, uh, knowing um, as a family, right? So, so it's not mine and his or his, it's like marital assets are ours. And so what do, what do we make? What do we owe? What do we own? What investments do we have? Languaging. <laughs> yeah, we. So if you keep, if he talks about mine and you talk about his, stop. Ours. That word may be triggering to whoever your spouse is. Say it anyway. You get used to saying ours. For those of you who are stay-at-home moms, you did not sign up for slavery. You did not fall in love and say, I will work for nothing and walk away from everything and raise the kids and not get paid. That was never any of our paradigms. So, So whether he makes a little bit of money or millions, it's ours. And so when you know... Um, what what you what your family income is, what your family expenses are, what your investments are, what your savings are, what your needs are. Needs being very important, right? That's where a certified financial divorce planner can come in and and help you forecast the next fifteen to twenty years of your life. Divorce is so largely about money. Make sure that you don't stick your head in the sand. Make sure you get educated and you get informed. Um, because it's going to be a vital part of how you're going to live the rest of your life. Very empowering point, Karen. Yeah, absolutely. So true. And the last one is on the kids. And, you know, I could talk about the kids for like three whole episodes. What I will say is uh, have a child-centric 
divorce. And even if your soon to be ex is not child centric, everything you say and do, every decision you make should be not you first, the children first. And it doesn't matter if your children are, mine were four and six when I told them, or if they're teenagers, or if they're 30 something. Um, the children are not put in the middle, even the adult children, even the adult children who have grandchildren, they're not put in the middle. Your children are not put in the middle. And so you talk to your girlfriend, you talk to your therapist, your, your divorce coach, you do not talk to your kids. And everything you do, if you make it child-centric and if you speak to your attorney or the forensic or the attorney for the children and everything is about the children, you are going to... Um, uh, be seen in a very positive light, and you are going to make decisions that are best for your kid's well being. Critically important point you just made absolutely, child centric divorce. And uh, if I could also just maybe deepen it a little bit by saying that's why, if you invest in a divorce coach or a support team of your choice, and you can shorten, ideally, shorten the length of the conflict or the divorce the better your chances are of keeping your divorce child centric. Yeah. Might you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're not, we're not really built to, to be in conflict for long periods of time. Um, and we might start off with the best intentions of not involving our, our children and keeping our children out of it. But again, we need to manage our emotions to be successful with that. Yeah. And, and, Divorce doesn't harm children as much as conflict harms them. And so uh, it, 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 you, a good piece of advice is if the kids are within earshot, bite your tongue until it's bloody. Like do not, do not go back and do not engage when they're in earshot, no matter what is said to you, bite your tongue until it's bloody and save it for when there are no little ears around. Oh, that's a powerful, powerful visual for um, something that's yeah. really, really important habit to, to create and maintain. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Karen, it's been so much fun talking with you. I got to admit that I could ask you about co-parenting and so many more topics, but we're heading towards the end of the hour now. And so I'll just ask you and I ask every guest on the Healing Broken Families podcast this at the very end. Would you um, like to share any healing or empowering truths with our audience um, that they can have a takeaway or walk away with it they, um, as a gift, as, a, as an imparting? Yeah, um, I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to do this. Uh, the first thing I want to say is you're more powerful than you think. Mm. And you have a strength inside of you and a power and a light inside of you that may have been dampened through your experience. This is your opportunity to shine. And keep the focus on yourself. It is very easy to see and wax on about the problems of, of the one that you're divorcing. There is no value. Nothing comes out of focusing on him or her. They're going to be part of your past. To focus on yourself, to roll your sleeves up, to do the very brave and courageous work of looking in the mirror and noticing and learning what you brought to the table that doesn't serve you, limiting beliefs, poor behaviors, and letting them go and learning ones that you want to replace them with and what you want to hold on to. That part of the journey is so priceless and will put you on a fast track to have the best of your life ahead of you. That's it. Thank you for that, Karen. I really, I really acknowledge that. I acknowledge you for the important work you did and what you just shared. If our, any viewers would like to learn more about you or connect with you, what's the best way that they can do that? First of all, thank you for what you do. And thank you again for having me on the show. It's just been delightful to chat with you. Thank you. And, and 
if somebody's interested in getting in touch, uh, Journey Beyond Divorce is the website and all of our other platforms. But we offer a free, um, we have a free giveaway. We call it a rapid relief call. And you get a full one hour coaching session with me or one of the coaches on my team, no strings attached. So if you're listening and something that I've said really touches you or you're struggling, you go to rapidreliefcall.com and you can book a call anytime that works for you. It's completely free and you will absolutely walk away with a lot of value. Wow. That's, that, that's our gift. That is a gift. And I'm sure there's many out there seeking rapid, rapid relief in the moment. Yeah. Uh, beautiful. All right. At this, at this moment, that's all we have time for today. Once again, thank you for taking the time to be with us. And if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe on Apple or Spotify or iTunes and, um, Feel free to leave a five-star review on Apple. It helps us, helps me to keep the content rolling out with great guests like Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. I also invite viewers to reach out to me at barbara at barbaralapointe.com. And as always, thanks for taking the time to be with us at the Healing Broken Families podcast, where we discuss and help you find solutions to divorce, parental alienation, and high-conflict personalities. I'm Barbara LaPointe, and I'm wishing every person in my audience deep healing and powerful solutions to serve the expansion of your life. Namaste, all the best, and thank you. See you next time. Namaste. Mm -hmm.